Hey everybody, my name is Chase Pipes and you're watching Chasing History, brought to you by the American Digger Magazine and the Smoky Mountain Relic Room. And we're in the town of Gudelheim in Germany, looking at the history of the last battle of knights on horseback in Germany. This is an era uh, that we all romanticize about. Right now I'm standing behind the city gates into the ancient city, the medieval city of Gudelheim. We're going to meet up with some local experts and talk about the history of the battle and I guarantee you this is gonna be an awesome ride. We're here with local historian Andreas Kerner. Andreas and I have been friends for many, many, many years, been on lots of adventures together. He's invited us to his home region and has studied the history of this area literally his entire life, being the local that he is. Andreas, dude, thank you so much You're for welcome. having us on this adventure. Now, you know, this is the last battle of knights on horseback. So, when, you know, I thought that knights extended into the 1400s and the 1500s. This is 1298. So when we talk about knights, what exactly are we talking about? Well, you have two types of knights. You have the knight that gets knighted by the queen or whatever. So you, it's a, a, a high-ranking person okay. that has a certain status. Like a knight owns a castle and he has men at arms in his castle. But in the common everyday language, people refer to anybody on horseback with armor and a halberd and a sword as a, to a, as a knight. Oh, so okay. There's knights today that technically are belonging to that class. What this means is basically that the men on horseback armored before the coming of firearms, where the armor made sense with the gauntlets and uh, swords and halberds. And who have that distinction of being knighted. So we, we, we kind of get confused where, you know, we, you know we, we look at images in the 14 and 1500s of battles with guys in armor and stuff. We're like, ah, they're knights. And, and really, it's, it's a class distinction. It's, it's you know, you have a, a, a lord or a, or a local ruler of the area who has dubbed you with this specific status. And so basically, when we talk about this battle, we talk about, you know, groups of men with this high status of being knighted. Yeah, there you know. was kings in this battle. Right. And then you had knights, actual knights, and you had the men at arms that the knights brought into battle. They gotcha. had armor and battle horses and swords and lances, but they weren't technically a knight. Right. But there were, the, the because we yes. have kings yeah, involved sure. in this yeah. battle, we have kings and the men who he knight, who they knighted, sure. and then their men at arms. Let's get into the weeds a little bit and just what's going on in Germany at this time? You know, it's the 1290s. You know, what's set up this battle for us? So in 1291, the German emperor Rudolf of Habsburg passes away and unlike you would normally think, um, his son Albert would have been the logical successor. But they had a really corrupt system in place. Uh, they had prince electors, uh, mostly bishops and a few knights. Um, and they did not want Albert to be king. Uh, first of all, he had a little bit of a temper apparently. Um, and he had lost an eye in battle. He was a badass pretty much. So Albert, um, was not their first choice because they were worried that the Habsburgs were a very powerful house and they didn't want to have their, cow, uh, their powers cut back. So they, as prince electors, had the power to deny him the kingship. And they elected instead Adolf of Nassau, who was from a small family. They didn't have many holdings. Uh, he was a weak guy and they thought, we can control this guy and uh, our power will actually increase. But after a few years of Adolf being king, he proved to be a pretty capable guy and he forged relationships with other kings around him uh, and he became too powerful for the prince electors. So without any kind of uh, legal backing and, and without having even a vote, they decided we'll sack this guy. Hey, you're no longer king and the guy we didn't want, Albert, is now really the better choice, so we'll make him king. And that's how the whole mess then started, because um, Adolf, of course, would not give up the crown. Albert considered himself now the legal king because the prince electors had chosen him. So they both raised an army, chased each other around a little bit, and on July 2nd, 1298, pretty much right outside the city gate, um, a big battle took place with about 38,000 knights and other soldiers, a lot of them on horseback, 
Um, and ultimately, Adolf of Nassau, the German king, fell in the battle. There's actually a cross that his widow had erected that's still here. Uh, we'll see that in a little bit, too. So basically, he who wins gets to be king. Yes, in this particular, in this particular case. Yeah, yeah. So, as you can see, it's a pretty complicated story, but to break it down really simply, this dude who, who was supposed to be king was way too powerful. All the bishops and everybody in control was like, ah, we don't want this guy, we want this guy because we can control him. This guy is sacked. This guy who they think they can tr control, they can't control. And they look at the original guy and go, okay, we want you to be king now, so go get this guy and, and get rid of him. And then this other guy is like, ah, I don't want to be dead. I'm going to fight for my right. You see how it can get into the, complicated in, into the weeds? It, it, it's pretty interesting, but you basically got for, what, a 10-year time span, number of years where they're kind About, of chasing each other around? Well, it, it wasn't that long, really. It was uh, so Adolf became king in 1292, and then really in uh, 1297, things started going down. So he was king for about five years. Okay. Um, and then it was really several months that they chased each other around. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> So that's the setup for this incredible battle. So now we're going to go take you to the actual battle site and show you what that looked like. I mean, if you can imagine 35,000 people, men at arms, in combat in a field is just overwhelming. Be prepared to be overwhelmed. <laughs> So right behind us, we have the actual battlefield itself. But Andreas, why is it here? Why why did these two armies happen to, to clash and fight in the field behind us? There's really no rhyme or reason. Um, King Adolf of Nassau was pushing south with his troops on a major road, um, and his rival Albert of Habsburg came north, and this is just where they met. There was no big plan to have it here so there was a town here so obviously there were uh, roads going through Correct. and this has just happened where they just happened to clash yeah and you got to imagine there was 24,000 troops on one side and about 14,000 on the other wow. so you had 38,000 people in this area fighting each other on horseback mostly but also some foot troops now what those those numbers were that just was are those numbers just men engaged or does that include their support as well no that, that's that's just soldiers at arms basically okay so you've uh, got you've got 34,000 soldiers in arms total plus their baggage their supplies right. their trains their people taking care of which the armor. wasn't as big a deal as you think like in Roman times the Romans had their whole everything with them uh, this was mostly they lived off the land they plundered as they went pretty much and and people had to give them food and the kings come in so gotcha all the food here. hence why there are walls around medieval towns and <laughs> gatehouses right to yeah. prevent plunder <laughs> so when these two armies meet here I mean d does does the fighting immediately start? I mean, do they start clashing? What 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 happened? Set up the battle for us. No, so basically, uh, Albert of Habsburg gets here first. He sets up uh, on the high ground over here behind us. Okay. Um, and so he has a strategic advantage. Okay. Um, King Adolf of Nassau arrives a little later, and he's going to be down here behind the creek, uh, in the bottom of the valley. Okay. And then the next day, basically is all like you know okay now we're ready and now, we're now ready we fight. move and so we see these two or it's like ah there's our enemy let's set up camp and get prepared ah there's the enemy let's set up camp and get prepared and so they set up their opposing sides the next morning comes out they come out and the battle commences yeah the the battle was fought in three stages really okay uh that we know of um and you have to imagine this is a really personal affair i mean you're on a horse and your enemies on a horse and you're riding and you they used maces and halberds and lances it's this bloody thing you know? bloody mess it's, i yeah. mean you're basically when you're fighting in in hand i mean this this is hand-to-hand -hand combat you so know your you, horse goes down you're on the ground you draw your sword because now your lance is useless pretty much and then you know you lose your helmet though <laughs> yeah you don't walk around to pick it up you keep going i mean th 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 this is a bloody affair i mean this is a personal affair i mean you were literally looking the face of you know who you're gonna kill or who's gonna kill you you know and, and it is literally okay you're faced with an opponent kill or be killed all right 
I killed that guy. Half a second later, ah, another opponent, kill or be killed. Ah, I kill that guy. Ah, another second, kill or be killed. I kill that guy. And hours and hours and hours of this. I mean, it, it's so hard for us to imagine in our daily lives being put in that situation. I mean, you're talking, you're putting in that situation again and again and again and again for the entirety of the battle. Literally, right there. 34,000 men engaged, 38,000 men, sorry, (laughs) engaged in that type of hand-to-hand combat. What type of weapons were they using at the time? So, your common soldiers had, everybody had a sword. Okay. Even the common soldiers had a sword? uh, Yes, for the most part. Depending, if if you were an archer, then maybe no. Right. uh, They had um, crossbows. Okay. uh, Maces. Okay. uh, Halberds. Lances. So no firearms yet. Okay. Yeah. Just so, all cutting weapons and, and And so were the So were the knights fighting just each other or were would the you know the, the knights or the you know because you've got you you've got several levels of you know technologically equipped men on this field fighting. You have got, you know, let's say the, the Abrams tank, you know, the 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 knight on horseback full armor, full helmet, shield, and his horse has got armor, like that's that's the top. On the very bottom, you've got the common foot soldier who may, basically has, what, a helmet and some light, helmet, light some, armor? Some chain mail, okay. you know, uh, maybe a breastplate. So would the guys on horseback in the tanks be fighting the, the foot soldiers? For the what? most part, say the king has his knights around him, and it was, so it would mostly be cavalry on cavalry. Okay. But of course, and the infantry on the infantry, but of course, if I turn around and here's the king on his horse and I get a cut in or whatever, I'll try. Right, you're gonna take it. But because, but you're not gonna be more than likely to take it because, you know, it's like, you know, uh, fighting an I'm opponent fighting 10, 10 levels above you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're basically gonna, gonna stick to your foot soldiery mm-hmm. kind of thing, right? Okay, so you said the battle has three stages. Take us through the stages of the battle. So we got guys on horseback. We've got guys fighting. Well, it just it ebbs back and forth. Okay, you know, we not too much has survived about the battle. Yeah, there's not a detailed, you right. know, it's post-action report of what happened years ago. <laughs> yeah, um, but so you know, one side gets the upper hand a little bit, push the other side back. They rally, they push them back, and and so. Then there was a break in between, apparently, a couple of times, and um, it's also a very physical affair. I mean, if you're carrying a hundred pounds of shield, lance, this, that, and you're running up and down this hill all day long, fighting other people, eventually you got to take a breather. And, and it was this thing, not like today, uh, in antiquity too, you had these almost like a, a mini truth or for, for a few, you know, for a little while, and. Um, I will retreat and I oh, will retreat and we'll really? regroup and then go back at it. That's now. crazy. Now, one of the interesting things uh, you were telling me about, you know, being a local and the local legend is is the legend of the three kings mm. that was on the battlefield. Can you get into that legend? Because I think that's an interesting tactic that so could have been used. King, King Adolf of Nassau um, wore his best armor. Uh, he wanted to show people he's in the front line. He's The king is in the front of the battle. Um, his horse had the German eagle on its cover, um, but he took his helmet off so that people would actually see who the king is and where the king is. Um, on many paintings that were all done in the 17 or 1800s, his opponent, Albert, is also depicted as wearing the crown helmet, the German eagle, because he also considered himself to be the king at the time. But there is this local legend that Albert of Habsburg decided he's gonna do a little bit of trickery and he wore the armor of a common foot soldier or a common soldier, at least not the king uh, because normally the king would be visible to everybody by his armor, by the eagle and all these things, the crown. So allegedly he had three knights dress up as the king and send them into the battle where he wouldn't be recognized as the king. And then King Adolf of Nassau spots his opponent, thinks it's the king, and kills him, and realizes that this is pretty much too easy, and turns around, here's another one. Um, 
So we don't know if that's really true, but it's a possibility. That's a pretty good trick, though, if you think about it. I mean, you know, like, ah, there's my opponent. Attack, ah, man, that was easy. I'm the one. There's another one. Ah, wait, wait a minute. You know, it just yeah. that's 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 pretty sharp thinking. You know, and you would have to. You know, here's the thing: is is that things like that are very well could have happened, but it's a it's a really cool local story, a local legend that has persisted into this day about the battle. So, you know, so behind us we have got the blood and carnage of the battle. Just just imagine this one thing, one fact we know about the battle that on the loser's side. Over 3,000 battle horses got killed in the battle. Uh, let that sink in for a minute. Uh, 3,000 battle horses. On one side. And on then one side. It says the, the winning side didn't fare much better. So call it 2,000 or whatever. So there's over 5,000 battle horses got killed in this battle. Besides thousands of people, of course. But um, there was just blood and gore you know, everywhere. Blood and gore everywhere, bodies. But let's look at the horses for a second. I mean, you know, these are. This was one of your most expensive mil pieces of military equipment. Wars your horse. You know, these battle horses aren't the show ponies of today. You know, these are highly trained, highly intelligent, highly maneuverable. You know tanks in a sense you know the the amount of time and effort that went into training that i mean we're talking years and years and years and to lose an animal like that i mean that that was like losing you know a, a you know an f-22 raptor i mean that was a lot of money that you lost so just think about you know you know five thousand horses scattered upon this battlefield so the battle is over who wins what what how, how does it so, end King Adolf of Nassau dies in the battle. How does he die? Do we know? Allegedly, he was uh, killed by a knight called Georg uh, on the other side. Um, but we really don't know. Yeah. Uh, we know he died. <clears throat> and um, the interesting thing is, so then Albert, his rival, basically de facto becomes king because he had already been chosen by the prince electors. Um, and... This is 1298, 10 years later, in 1308, just a little, uh, Albert gets killed by his own family. Well, that was uh, nice. <clears throat> and gets buried in the cathedral in Speyer, where the German kings of the time were being buried. Now, after the battle, Albert refused that honor to his opponent. So King Adolf of Nassau was buried in a small abbey, not, even a mile from here. Um, and after Albert had been murdered in 1308, the new king then said, yeah, he can be buried in Speyer in the cathedral. So they moved his body to Speyer. And since 1309, they lay <clears throat> next to each other. Oh, that's hilarious. It's a bit ironic. You know. Oh, that's funny. So ah, he thought he was king, but no, let's not bury him in the chapel in Speyer where all the kings are buried. Go stick him up in this abbey over there. And then you know the he gets killed by a kid by a family member and then the next king's like ah put them both together in the abbey next to each other let them fight there for eternity yeah, yeah. that's pretty hilarious that's pretty cool so what happens after politically what happens afterwards in in, in germany a, after this battle what what is, what is the major you know uh, consequence of this battle really not as much as you think these kings came and went okay um, it's very rare that you had a king who was stable enough to be there for a few decades or whatever. Um, so the battle only really settled that brief dispute, brief in history, you know, a decade or so, um, between Adolf of Nassau and Albert of Habsburg. Okay. But what, what happened was really that the House of Habsburg once again became powerful and, and now Habsburg was German king. Okay. One of the interesting things about battlefields is is that, you know, especially in Europe on places like this, in, in the same spot, you know, there are kind of a re, there's a reason why battle battlefields are where they are, you know, because the, you know, at that time, you know, it, geography meant a lot, you know, this town being here meant a lot, the road being there meant a lot, you know, yes, this was a meeting engagement, but, you know, it was kind of because there was a nice town here. But what's fascinating about battlefields in Europe is, is that, you know, sometimes you get these battles that overlay each other. 
But what's really fascinating is, is in the t beginning of the 20th century, you had a brand new battlefield, one that men who fought on this field could literally, in their wildest dreams, could never have imagined. And there was an artifact found here locally that, uh, that, we, that we were shown, and we want to show you, that talks about a battlefield of the 20th century. Andreas? So this is a 50 caliber, actually a 50 BMG Browning machine gun, American round, uh, World War II, and that fell from a American bomber. If you ever see the footage of the tail gunner in the bomber with the machine guns shooting at German fighter uh, planes that are trying to intercept the bombers on their way to bombing a major city. So here, there was nothing going on here. Americans didn't bomb this area. There was no industry. <clears throat> there was no land battles in World War II. No, just, just the you know, American soldiers coming in, pushing out whatever German soldiers were left. There was nothing, maybe a shot, few shots fired. No, no yeah. big deal. Um, but shell casings and bullets rained down from the sky where there was a battle between German fighters and American bombers going somewhere to Bomber City. So this new battlefield on top of the old battlefield. But what's so cool is, is it's a battlefield that they would have never expected. It's a battlefield that is literally in the sky. If you can think about it for a second, we've got a battlefield from the 13th century behind us. In the early to middle part of the 20th century, we have a new battlefield up there where men are fighting with new machines, new horses for their lives. And evidence of that on the old battlefield is that right there. Now if that isn't cool, I don't know what is. One thing we don't think about when we think about World War II battles is, is that, you know, some of the battlefields of World War II are literally in the sky. We can't go see them. I mean, we can, we can look up, but those were battles with technologies, with the horses of the 21st century being fought 15, 20,000 feet up. And the artifacts from those battles can rain on the old battle, on the old battlefield. That's just too, <laughs> too cool, man. That is, that is super cool. Now that the battle was finished, there needed to be official documentation to record the victory and record officially who was gonna be the king. The Prince Electors were called, a document was filled out and signed by each of the Prince Electors. This is that document. And if you look across the bottom, you can see the original wax seal for each of the Prince Electors who signed. What makes this important is, is this sealed the victory. This made it official. Albert I is now King of Germany. It is very rare that we get an opportunity to see an artifact attributed to a person this far back in time. During construction work in the Spire Cathedral, not too far from us, the tomb of King Alfred I was discovered, and within that tomb was this sword. This is a sword that possibly could have seen combat at the Battle of Gulheim. This is the sword that could have won him the kingship of Germany. It's incredible to bear witness to something that witnessed history. You know, one of the things that I wish I was able to do is to be able to hold an artifact and to see everything that it saw. Imagine the story that it could tell. But thanks to happenstance construction work, we all get the opportunity to check out something that could have witnessed an incredible period in German history. So behind us marks the spot of the death site of the king. But which king's going on? We got a couple kings going on here. So what's... Uh, Adolf of Nassau. Okay. So the one who actually was made king officially by the prince electors. Okay. And then he became too powerful. Um, and yeah, he perished in this battle at this exact spot. Um, and the cross actually was put up in 1309, so 11 years after the battle, by his wife for the occasion when his body was actually transferred uh, to the uh, cathedral in Speyer. Okay. Why do they, why, why do people in medieval times feel it's important to mark <coughs> the death spots of kings? I mean, and why was she, if this guy was, you know, king and then was killed, you know, to take his throne, why was she even allowed to put up a monument in the first place? Well, you could, you know, go back even further. I mean, she was here for the battle, pretty much. The abbey where he was first buried, uh, local legend has it that she actually 
uh, waited out the battle and it's less than a mile from here um, and it would have probably been really easy for the vi uh, the victors to you know capture her or kill her or whatever but that's not how they worked back then I got it you. was between two guys and that's the I got you and you can also hear behind us there's a modern road here so why is it that you know we've got modern buildings modern streets in the middle of this medieval battlefield so the actual old city the medieval city had a wall around it for protection and it's a little bit that way but uh, after the 1700s the city expanded uh, greatly and now encompasses part of the battlefield so we're okay. standing on this blood-soaked ground where thousands of people perished in this battle including the king and uh, in the in the 1800s when the city really encroached on this area uh, they built this little chapel over it that wasn't there there was just a simple stone cross that was attached to a wall separating two fields back then and in 1853 they built this little chapel to protect the cross and make sure nobody like builds a house there and moves it yeah because we've got houses there 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 really fast cars and guys staring at us going there so i mean that's that's just it about history is in historical places you know you may be on some city street somewhere and not even fathom or imagine when you're driving your car as fast as you can behind the camera <laughs> that there was a medieval battle that took place or a, some important thing happened because that's just the mark of the progress of human civilization is it's always going to expand it's always going to keep going but you know hopefully people can take them upon themselves to save historic places and historic sites like this spot there's not a house here because in the 1300s the widow decided that hey we should mark this spot and it should be saved and protected in the 1800s that idea was expanded upon and thankfully we now have a great place to come visit and check out we're down inside the crypt here at the Medieval Cathedral in Spire, Germany. This is a very important spot for early German history because there has been a church on this site since at least the 8th century AD. But this also has importance to our story because literally, side by side, are our two combatants buried next to each other. Upon one of our combatants' death, they were buried in an abbey not too far from the battlefield. But then in 1308, at the death of the German king, the victor of the battle, both bodies were brought to this cathedral and buried alongside all of the other early medieval German kings. But it also marked the last burial of a German king here in this cathedral. It's one of these funny coincidences that you see, not really coincidences, but one of these funny things that you see in history, you know, that happen again and again and again. And it's just an interesting twist to our tale that these two men who fought against each other for the crown of Germany will have to spend eternity literally side by side. So we want to leave you guys with one last little tidbit of history, one, one, one cool little story. And, and it's the reason why, you know, when you go into an area, you need to look at the greater history of that area. Look at what, what else happened there besides what you're there to see. Because it might actually surprise you like this surprised the hell out of me. Andreas, what do we have behind us? So behind us you see a plant, a cement plant to be precise, called Tückehoff Cement. It's a well-known local uh, business. Uh, it was founded in the 1800s. And what's really cool about it is the cement from this quarry, 8,000 barrels of it, was shipped to America in the 1800s to build the base of the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. That, and, and, and dude, we Googled this, because <laughs> I was like, there's no, why, why wouldn't they just go to New Jersey, you know, and get cement there? But actually they did, the quality, well, it's, it's, that's it. The quality of the lime that was here, or the limestone that was here and used to make the cement was, you know, a phenomenal quality. Plus, the company was one of the largest and could handle an order that size. So that's why, you know, that's why it's important to look at the greater history surrounding an area. You know, we're here to film an episode about a battle in the 1290s, you know, that happened right there. And literally, right there, you have a, you know, 
this other awesome bit of history that you would have never have known or never thought about. And that's why it's important. That's why we study history. It's for the unexpected, to learn something new that we absolutely didn't expect. Andreas, dude, thank you so much for taking You're us welcome. around and showing us your home and you know, showing everybody out there this incredible story of this awesome battle. We really appreciate it. And thank you guys for watching. <coughs> if you want to learn more about us, you can go on to our social media, Chasing History on Facebook, uh, Chasing History on Instagram. If you want to know more about what we're about, go check out our YouTube channel, Chasing History, and watch everything we've got. We've got a lot of great stories in our past catalog and coming ahead because we are not stopping. History is incredible, and we're going to keep going out there and telling that story. And remember, guys, history rocks. Woohoo! <laughs>